Episode 4, Splatterhouse Retrospective. There are three things that will always be. Death, taxes, and violent video games. So if these three things are universally known, why haven't people figured it out? PETA is angry about Cooking Mama and Super Meat Boy, Australia is angry about Mortal Kombat, and your mom hates Dead Space 2. More and more, individuals and establishments are angry about violence in video games, while at the same time, games are becoming more violent. To make matters worse, real people are committing horrible acts of violence and blaming games for helping them to kill. Here's the truth, folks. Guns and video games don't kill people. Stupid people kill people. If you think your friend, child, or relative shouldn't be playing violent video games, don't play them. Complaining about it just makes it worse. Anyone who kills because of playing video games probably had something wrong before they started playing them. In 1988, Namco released Splatterhouse, the story of college student Rick and his girlfriend Jen, who investigate a mansion once owned by Dr. West, a parapsychologist famous for creating monsters and experimenting with evil forces. Their journey to the mansion leaves Rick fatally injured, and Jen a captive by the mansion's evil residents. Somehow Rick stumbles upon an ancient mask that contains a supernatural force that saves Rick, turning him into a beast of a man who can combat the monsters and save his girlfriend at an unknown cost, because, you know, nothing is free. Splatterhouse was originally released for the arcades with the TurboGrafx-16 port following in 1990. The game was very violent. Rumors are that it was banned from arcades in the US. The game is a traditional side-scrolling action game with multiple stages. Rick can jump, punch, kick, and use various attacks to destroy his enemies. Splatterhouse is a learn and conquer game. Learn the patterns of the levels and react accordingly. The enemies are destroyed in a gory fashion as the splatter in the title suggests. Other sources of gore come from the background, having impaled monsters, secreted residue or goop, body parts, and blood everywhere. The game's soundtrack adds to the horror by using less melodic material and more random sounds and noises. All in all, it creates a very compelling atmosphere. The game is actually pretty difficult. There is a cheap chainsaw boss that you have to cheat by dragging two shotguns to the end of the stage, and bubbles in the second to last stage that make me want to punch Menchi, and he doesn't really deserve that. The TurboGrafx-16 port has better control than the arcade, and its better hit detection allows for a less trying experience. They changed the mask from the original white in the arcade to a purple color to avoid plagiarism. They did change one of the bosses, and for some reason these candles are floating in midair. The arcade version has a table here. It's like they just forgot about it. Anyway, it's a solid port. Released in 1989, there was an obscure title for the Nintendo Entertainment System that was not released in the U.S. known as Wenpaku Graffiti. It is basically a chibi version of Splatterhouse. It is fun and has several of the Splatterhouse trademarks like flying furniture and creepy locales. The gore is still there, but not very much. There is an Egyptian level and a dancing Saturday Night Fever-esque Dracula boss. Obviously, the game doesn't take itself very seriously. It's worth checking out if you own a Famicom or an emulator. So apparently, at the end of the first game, Rick's girlfriend is still missing. Released in 1990 for the Sega Genesis, Splatterhouse 2 involves Rick's return to the mansion. The story hasn't changed, and neither has the gameplay. The controls are smoother, and most of the series staples like portals, boar worms, the terror mask, the gore, and an overly voluptuous girlfriend are still here. New monster designs and stages await, the music is more melodic this time, showing off the mediocre Genesis sound chip, but it manages to create somewhat of an atmosphere. If you like the first game, the second should be enjoyable as well. It has some hard spots, but it seems to be less difficult than the first, or at least, less annoying. The graphics are great for the Genesis, and the new gory boss deaths are a nice touch. In 1993, Splatterhouse 3 changed up the formula. Now the game is more like a beat-em-up than a platformer. Rick now lives with Jin, and they have two kids. The goal of the game is to save your family from the demons that have infested the house. Each stage is a floor of the mansion, and is also timed. Use your map to find the quickest way through and beat the boss before time runs out. 
succeed and your family lives. Don't succeed and they die. I think that part 3 gets the horror and the narrative the best out of the series. The realistic images in the cutscenes and the creepy vibes in the music and atmosphere bring the game to life. Rick has more moves at his disposal like throws, grabs, and the ability to transform with increased defense and power. Forward back forward on the control pad does the spin kick, which is the most effective in clearing out enemies. The enemies aren't too varied and end up becoming the victims of pallet swaps. They do take battle damage, which is nice. I did finally get around to playing the Xbox 360 incarnation and had a good time. The game is a third person beat em up like God of War and has the same narrative as the first game so it's pretty much a remake. With the current age of graphics, the gore is more gruesome than ever before. The core campaign is around 7 to 8 hours, but it's three difficulty modes, lots of achievements and collectibles, and an added survival mode. Lots of reviews said that the combat was sloppy, but I thought the control was tight and the different move sets made killing monsters entertaining. As I do this review, the game is around $25. That is a steal considering that the original trilogy of games is unlockable in their original versions. Here are the pros and cons for each game. Spirehouse 1 is fun with a great horror atmosphere, but lacks the tightness of control and has some goofy hit detection. Spirehouse 2 is solid with improved control, but the game lacks anything new or original. Part 3 is the most fun and engrossing of the series. The spin kick is an extremely broken move, however. You become invincible when using it, and there's no limit. The enemies also have some broken attacks, and you can die in a single shot from some of them. Also, getting knocked over while jumping is a real pain. The Xbox remake is fun with lots of ways to keep combat fresh. The splatter kills take a while to watch and can become repetitive, and the lack of any new scenarios other than kill all the monsters to clear the way forward is a little annoying. The mask also never shuts up. You will end up turning the volume down or off completely to save yourself from its comments on everything. I also personally think the gore is a little overkill, but it is Splatterhouse and not Rick's House of Modesty. In conclusion, violent video games will always be a part of gaming. The only thing that matters is that the wrong people not be exposed to them. Splatterhouse is a violent and bloody game series, but it is not without atmosphere, artistry, and style. Till next time, this is Retro Rare Reviews. Dan Taylor, signing off.